Thank you, Mason. That was a beautiful, beautiful introduction, and congratulations to the awardees. I can't tell you how excited I am to be here with all of you, President Ryan, beloved family members, treasured friends, and absolutely the extraordinary class of 2023. Um, Lara, you said it so beautifully. You all have earned this place, and um, you've worked hard for it. I actually uh, graduated in 1983, so President Ryan, uh, I am definitely not cool, um, but I'm here. And it is hard to believe that it was 40 years ago when tomorrow I would be sitting where you all will be sitting. I was excited and idealistic, and I had dreams in my head of changing the world, and I didn't have a clue how to start. Truth is, I wasn't a standout at UVA. I worked two jobs to put myself through, through school, mostly as a bartender. Back then, the drinking age was 18 for beer, uh, a situation that my peers liked a lot. But it meant that I wasn't in a sorority or a political organization. I didn't play on a sports team. I worked, okay, and I danced. Uh, sometimes on tables, and I still dance a lot. And though I had an amazing circle of beloved friends, the truth is, on the inside, I felt like an outsider. I was seemingly confident, but I had a tender heart, as if there were a bull and a dove swirling inside of me, one side courageous, one side questioning. And I've learned that perhaps that sense of being an outsider also gave me superpowers. It gave me a sense of empathy, an understanding of how people who also feel on the outside may not fully understand systems that don't seem to work for them. And when I also reflect on my younger self, I'm grateful for my struggles in paying for school. I gained a deep sense within me that no matter what life threw at me, I could find a way through. Laura talked about some of the challenges you all have faced. I hope you find a reservoir of strength and that same sense that there's nothing now you can't do. What inspires me so much about your generation is that so many of you are not satisfied with the status quo and you want to do something about it. I'm guessing your goal is not simply to get out of EUVA, earn a ton of money, and have a comfortable life. I'm guessing you want to do something that matters. What's more, every generation stands on all of the knowledge of every previous generation. That means you all are smarter, with more tools, more skills, more access, more connections to people across the world than I and my, my peers could have dreamed. And now is your time to tackle the problems that are uniquely of this moment. And it doesn't mean that my generation has to step back. I'm still pursuing dreams so big, I might never realize them in my lifetime. And I am still a pragmatic idealist. I've got lines on my face and hardened edges, hard edges that have been softened by tumbling along the hard, long road of change. But on most days, I am filled with a deep sense of joy, of meaning. I've gained a little bit of wisdom along the way, too. Mostly, I know change is possible because I have lived it. The kind of change I have seen usually starts with one or two people in a big dream, and then a lot of years of hard work that ends with them changing millions, and in some cases, hundreds of millions of lives. So let me share three lessons that have been drivers in my own hope, in my own life, in hopes that you will give yourself permission to believe in the power of your dreams and have the courage to do something about it. The first is just start. Trying to make a difference in the world isn't easy, yet so many people live provisionally. 
They think, I will start working on my purpose as soon as dot, dot, dot. I go to business school, I make enough money, I get married, I raise my kids, I buy a house, and before you know it, 20, 30, 40 years pass, and people start wondering what happened, and what would have happened had I dared to make a change a little easier. But just know that at every moment, every day in your life, you have a choice. If you see an opportunity to do something that could take you where you want to go, don't wait for the perfect. Take it. My first moving move coming out of UVA was to be a banker. Now, truth is, I didn't really want to be a banker. But this was a job that would take me to 40 countries in three years and I really wanted to travel. But I found that this would be a way that I could learn to know and love the world. The income also came at a crucial moment. And what surprised me was that I gained incredible skills, tools, frameworks, not only that I loved, but that I still use in my work today. Chase Manhattan Bank took me to places like Brazil, where I would go on the weekends and see low-income people totally vital, laboring in colorful, alive places, yet they couldn't get alone. And so I thought to myself, I want to take these same tools and find ways to extend them to people who've been overlooked and underestimated and see what we could do. So I started looking for a different job, trying to get myself back to Brazil but Brazil wasn't on offer. The only position I could find was in West Africa, which was not in my game plan. But I decided to go. The hardest part about leaving my job was telling my parents. My father thought I was giving up the career of a lifetime. My mother was sure I would never marry. And for me, I didn't want to let them down. But I knew that if I didn't make the move then, I might never make it. There is only one person who can live your life, and that is you. So just start. Lao Tzu wrote that the journey of a thousand miles begins with a single step. I took mine and fell flat on my face. I arrived in the Cote d'Ivoire full of enthusiasm with these, enthusiasm with these new tools that were going to help solve big problems. And what I found is that most people don't want helping. They certainly don't want saving. I didn't understand the context and the people enough. People want to solve their own problems. I had to come to understand that real change is mutual change, and that you shouldn't go to serve unless you understand that my dignity is bound in yours, and vice versa. I also learned that if you rule out failure, you rule out success. Now, one thing about leaving everyone you love and giving away almost everything that you own is that it really raises the stakes of trying. I was not going to go home after a single failure. So I picked myself up, I moved to the other side of the continent, to Kenya, and I tried again and I failed. This time, I was working with an organization that was in a messy situation, and I thought I would be an incredible support by analyzing the entire situation and presenting it to the executive director so that the organization could solve its own problems. The problem is, was that I didn't build trust. And I literally, whether I was right or not, watched my insights and my work go up in flames. This time I learned that trust is the rarest, the most precious, the value, most valuable currency that we have. Failure is a powerful teacher. Therefore, just start has a crucial second part. Let the work teach you. When I finally landed in Rwanda, less than a year after I left New York City, I'd learned a new humility. I learned that people will tell you the truth if you show up, if you start by asking questions, 
If you learn to listen, not from a place of trying to convince or to convert, but to be changed yourself. I understood that if we were going to build a Rwandan bank, the women of Rwanda would have to own and to manage it. Sure, I could be a co-founder, but this time we had to be a lot more important than I. And in a few years, our small but mighty group of five co-founders did start a bank. We called it Dutrembre, to mean, to, 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 which means go forward with enthusiasm, and that's what we did. And I saw that a small group of people could change a corner of history. But my time in Wanda also taught me that top-down aid, government programs, too often creates dependency which is the opposite of dignity or choice, agency. And maybe most important, that dignity is, the most is more important to the human spirit than wealth. Had I not taken that step to go to West Africa, I would not have known how to take a step to start Acumen, the nonprofit organization I started to invest in for-profit companies to solve big problems of poverty. And I'm still just starting each time building on the work that's gone before, sometimes falling, always getting up to try again. So just start and let the work teach you. Second, hold values in tension. Our desire for easy solutions does not match the complexity of our world today. My work investing in social enterprises has taught me that if we will only solve our toughest problems if we are willing to embrace nuance, a clarion call that is hard to hear above the din of our broken, fractured conversations. Let me give you an example. Capitalism. For it or against it? I've been working with the tools of capitalism for 40 years. I love it and I hate it. On the one hand, for-profit companies provide an incredible rapid feedback system to understand what customers want and value. On the other, too often corporations overlook, exploit the poor, and do not take into account the damage to the environment. Fifteen years ago, 1.5 billion people on the planet lacked access to electricity. A few social entrepreneurs decided to go where both markets and government had failed the poor, to learn what it would take to bring solar energy to people who hadn't really counted. Today, those companies have served hundreds of millions of people, and now we can actually imagine what it would take to electrify the world. But there are still 800 million people without electricity. Markets are not going to bring electricity to the last mile. The only way we will do it is in partnership with government and philanthropy and civil society. The only way we'll do these kinds of hard things is with all of us. So this is a moment to reimagine capitalism, not just fight between capitalism and socialism, to reimagine it. I've learned so much from investing in entrepreneurs that are tackling some of our biggest problems, like our broken food systems. They understand that too many of our smallholder farmers who make, who produce the food we eat, cannot afford to feed their own families. And now they're building companies that put the farmers in the center, or entrepreneurs that see our waste and are converting it into treasure, into gold, fertilizer and animal feed and vegan leather and whole new industries. That excites me. It is the moral Im imagination of these entrepreneurs that assure me of our collective capacity to reimagine a future that puts our shared humanity and the earth at the center of our systems, not just profit. I have learned that we can change the system because we are the system. Holding values and tension is a path to wisdom. You all live in a time of great uncertainty, where vicious debates are held on social media in hyperspeed. We can be quick to judgment, quick to find safety in people who think like us. 
Learning to hold the tensions has taught me how people who might see each other as adversaries can rally around solutions that tap into our better selves. But this takes the courage of seeing the humanity that lies in each of us. And this is very personal to me. A few, few years after I left Rwanda, I started to hear my friends talking about their mistrust for each other. Things were falling apart, and in 1994, the country erupted into a bloody genocide, killing more than half a million people in 100 days. I lost many friends in that period, and I decided I had to go back to the country to understand at a deeper level not only what had happened, but what does it mean to be human? Of my five co-founders, women played every conceivable role. Victim, bystander, and yes, perpetrator. I remember visiting a prison to see Agnes, one of a co-founder and a parliamentarian who had been convicted for the highest crimes of genocide. We sat knee to knee. And I looked at her with this girl-like face, her head shaved, big eyes, freckles, a perfectly pink, pressed prison dress. And I thought, she doesn't look like a monster. And then it hit me. Monsters and angels live in all of us. Monsters are our broken parts. There are fears and insecurity, our, our shames, our petty grievances. And in, in times of instability, like today, it becomes easy for demagogues to prey on those broken parts, to cast blame on people who look unlike ourselves, to sometimes make those people seem less human, and in extremes, convince us to do terrible things. Our challenge in this time of inequality, all of us, our challenge in this time of social media that's toxic, us versus them politics, is to learn to suppress those monsters and let set free our better angels. We must learn to balance our audacity with a new humility. We humans are too easily manipulated by fear and by cynicism and the great irony is that fear and cynicism are the best allies of the status quo. The fearful hide away. The cynics do not create the future. The role of moral leadership today is to counter fear and cynicism with calls to moral reasoning, with calls to a shared vision, with calls to love for each other and for our planet. And to do that, you have to get comfortable being uncomfortable. But the good news is this. When you feel that yourself in that place and you are alone and uncomfortable, stay there. Because I've come to see that that discomfort is a proxy for progress. So hard work, commitment, resilient, Discomfort showing up not just for years, but sometimes for decades. That's what it takes to make real, sustained change. But before you run for the hills, there's something else. If you embark on the lifelong journey of change, I assure you, you will come across two glorious fellow travelers. Their names are beauty and hope. And my final entreaty, therefore, look for them, welcome them, embrace beauty, embrace hope. Ten days ago, I was visiting one of our companies on the, the shores of Lake Victoria in western Kenya. There I met a grandmother named Rebecca, petite and fierce. Rebecca raised her family as an agricultural farmer, and then her husband died too, too early. And one day she was looking at the, at the lake and noticing that the men weren't going out far into the middle of the lake to hunt and hope that they could catch fish, sometimes bringing just a few or none home. 
that instead they were cultivating little fingerlings and growing them to big ample fish that they could sell at local markets for protein and making good income. And while Rebecca had never fished in her life, she saw an opportunity to change her life, and so she took it. She became a fish farmer, unfortunately, before the technology was really perfected, and so she lost everything. And then the company Aquaretch came to the shores of the lake and offered her loans and training and fish feed, and so she tried again. This time, she grew her own business to 40,000 fish, and then climate change hit. An algae bloom wiped everything out again. So she went to her friends to see if she could borrow money, start again. I said, wait, Rebecca, as she was telling me this story, you failed twice and then you went back to your friends again. And she said, this is what we do in Kenya. In difficult times, we help each other. I said, sure, I get that. But this is a third failure, Rebecca. This is not a woman of wealth. And she said, Jacqueline, life gives you hard things. You have a choice. If you sit and do nothing, I promise life will just get worse. So you get up, you try, you decide to make life work. You know, she said, in Luo, my native language, we have a saying, chaka chaka, just begin, just start. Of course, I had no choice but to just hug her. Rebecca is rebuilding, and it's a complex story. She's grown her business now to 30,000 fish, and she has big aspirations, not really for herself, but for her community. How can you be so alive, I said, as she was speaking with so much enthusiasm. She said, I love my life, my family, my children, my community, I want to serve. I love being a leader. I realized then that she has what so many of us yearn to have. She feels seen, a sense of belonging. She knows she's needed. As I listened to this wise woman speaking, I started to feel overwhelmed. I could see the light, or maybe the divinity in her, and in the connection with her, I could feel it in myself. In that connection was beauty and hope and the seeds of our mutual transformation. And I have found that same sense of beauty and hope in distant hamlets and in some of the meanest, cruelest neighborhoods in the world beauty and hope when people gather to double joys and celebrate and to hold each other in grief. I too have seen people find their deepest beauty themselves, sometimes in the darkest, most difficult times. When we dare to immerse ourselves in the world, serving, creating, trying, we might get a few bruises and scratches and lines, but so do we increase our chances of being fully alive and equally as important, wonderfully, beautifully, impossibly, wholly human. So I am inviting, I am inviting you today to hold to a dream that matters. It should be your dream, not mine. I started out fighting poverty and, and found out that what I really wanted to do was build dignity. Now I understand that I want to be fully used up before I die. You might dream of being a banker, an inventor, an engineer, an architect, an artist, a dancer, a rocket scientist, a designer, a social worker, a social entrepreneur, Whatever you decide, you're all needed. But don't think you need to have answers today. The world is too complex. What you can do 
is follow the thread of your curiosity. Hold to it through ups and through downs. And I promise you, if you do that long enough, before you know it, you'll find yourself coming home to your truest self. So start. Let the work teach you. Hold the tensions. Embrace hope. Know there is beauty all along the way. Just promise me that you don't forget to dance. I wish the class of 2023 all good things, huge congratulations, and an amazing graduation this weekend. Thank you.